Good everyone. Everybody doing all right today? Man, it's good to see you guys. Also want to welcome everybody tuning in online right now. Uh, hey, before we get started, I just have to, again, echo uh, the Flourish Ladies Night and just, just to celebrate what God did. Um, man, just a huge shout out to uh, the ladies that spoke on Friday night. We had Heather Bowman, Lori Thomas, our kids director, and then Jeanette Holloway. And they did an amazing job, did they not, ladies? incredible job and listen there was a lot of moving parts and so much stuff that took place behind the scenes and there's probably a whole list of names that i could name off but i'll probably leave someone out ladies you know who you are thank you thank you for making flourish what it was and uh, i know god did something incredible and be on the lookout for our next flourish ladies night next year it's gonna be awesome all right well, uh, we are in the second week of Heart of Worship, and I encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message. This is a six-week series that we're walking through as a church to really know, to really learn what worship is all about. And just to kind of recap on last week, we talked about that you and I were created to worship God. Worship is more than just singing, it's more than just listening to a song, it's more than clapping, it's more than lifting our hands, it is a lifestyle. And God has created us for his glory and to declare his praise, and we praise whatever we enjoy. And so what we learned last week, and this was the big takeaway, the bi if you don't hear anything else, you need to understand that the heart of worship is about glorifying God and enjoying him I'm gonna say that again I want you to say it with me okay let's say it together the heart of worship okay is about glorifying God and enjoying him okay that is what worship is all about it's a lifestyle where God has created us for his glory and to enjoy him but that also is an overflow into singing and why we gather on Sundays it's to glorify God and enjoy him. It's not about us whatsoever. And that was kind of the main big thoughts that we had from last week. And so today, we're going to direct our attention to Isaiah chapter 6. And just to kind of give you a little context, uh, in today's text, we see this young man named Isaiah who God has called to be a prophet. And before God sends him out, uh, to go and proclaim judgment really to a rebellious nation in Israel, God basically gives him a, either a vision or actually allows him to come into heaven physically. We don't really know the details, but somehow he is escorted into a worship service that's taking place in heaven, and something amazing takes place. And so what I want to do is I want to read from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, and they each had six wings. With, with two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord, then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal, that he had taken away from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, now, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who will I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Would you guys just pray with me? Holy Father, we come to you right now and we thank you, God, for your amazing grace and mercy. We thank you that we could gather here today to celebrate you, to worship you, to fellowship with one another, and to learn your word, Lord God. Father, I ask that your spirit 
would help us today to learn, to help us be attentive, to lean into what you have to say to us today through your word, Lord God. I pray that Jesus would be lifted up on high and that, God, that you would help us to see you clearly for who you are so that, God, we would respond with authentic worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago, uh, we went down to the beach and I made the mistake of forgetting to bring my contacts. And if you're anything like me, without my glasses or contacts, everything is blurry. <laughs> I can't see anything, right? And so we get down to the beach, I realize I didn't have my contacts, and obviously I can't go into water with my glasses, and so we get down there, and I'm like, oh well, what, what are we going to do, you know? And so I take off my glasses, go down into the water with my kids as they're leading me by the hand because I can't see anywhere, right? And, and to be honest, I had the worst time. <laughs> It was a horrible time, a horrible experience at the beach. I mean, I could not see how beautiful the beach was. I couldn't see the water. I couldn't even see where my kids were. I mean, everything was just a blur. If there were sharks in the water, I had no idea. Okay, so I was freaking out about that, okay? And, and, and literally, I just had a miserable time. I probably made it miserable for my wife and my kids just because I was pouting the whole time. Man, I can't see anything, you know? But then fast forward, the very next year, I was prepared, right? I had plenty of contacts, plenty. I was like, I came prepared for the beach this year. And man, can I tell you, I had an incredible time. And honestly, uh, no lie, no exaggeration, it was probably the best time that I ever had at the beach. And we spent hours and days out there enjoying God's beautiful creation. The water was crystal clear. The weather was perfect. Man, I was hanging out with my kids. I was wrestling with my sons, showing them who's the boss, throwing them in the water. I was boogie boarding. Man, and we just spent hours out there. And I did not want to leave. And the reason why I'm sharing this today is because the quality of my enjoyment had everything to do with how good I could see. The quality of my experience was literally dictated by how clear I could see the beauty of God's creation. And can I tell you guys something that is the same thing when it comes to the worship of God? See, how clearly we see God or how we view God determines the quality of our worship. How clearly we see God determines our enjoyment of him. And this is so important because I love what A.W. Tozer said, right? And I like using, I like quoting individuals sometimes. Maybe I, sometimes I overquote, but there's some, there's some writers out there that they say some profound things. And I encourage you to read some of his books like The Knowledge of the Holy and, and just some deep stuff. And he says this, he says, in my opinion, the greatest single need of the moment is that lighthearted, superficial religionist be struck down with a vision of God, high and lifted up with his train filling the temple. And by religionist, he's talking about Christians who are just going through the motions. About individuals who have faith in Christ, but man, they are not excited maybe about the things of God. They're not excited about even gathering for worship at times. And he says, in my opinion, the great single need is that they would be struck down with a vision of God. And this is that idea, how clearly we see God determines the quality of our worship. And see, I, I think that the reason why some of us struggle to live a lifestyle of worship, of honoring God in our lives, is because we just don't see God clearly. The reason why some of us, maybe, when we gather here on Sundays, we don't feel like singing a song, we don't feel like engaging in worship, and maybe we feel like we're just going through the motions, is maybe because you don't see God for who He is. The quality of our enjoyment with God has everything to do with how clearly we see Him. And today we see several things that Isaiah sees. 
He's escorted into heaven, and his eyes are open to see God for who he is. And honestly, that has been my prayer over the last several weeks as I've been preparing this message, is that we wouldn't leave here today going, cool, you know, that was a great message. I can't wait to go to McDonald's, pick up my food. I can't wait to watch a football game today. My prayer is that we would leave here with our eyes opened. I didn't come here to preach about myself. I literally came here to hopefully do an honest job in a humble way to lift Jesus up higher. And that we would be a church that truly sees the Lord for who he is. And that we would respond with enjoyment with what we see. And so let's talk about what Isaiah sees. The first one is this, is that he sees God's sovereignty. He sees God's sovereignty. The word sovereignty literally means supremacy or authority. And what you need to understand about the Lord is that he is sovereign, meaning he possesses all authority. He possesses supreme authority. Listen to this in Isaiah 6, 1. He says, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne and the hem of his robe filled the temple. I saw the Lord. His eyes were open. Now, it's interesting because we know from script, other scripture verses, no one has ever seen Yahweh. God told Moses that no one can see him and live. Yet Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And so who is he talking about here? Well, what's interesting, and I want you to lean into this, okay? This word Lord, if you translate it into the Hebrew, is the word Adonai. And it literally means Master. And it conveys a sense of sovereignty. And we know, we've talked about this before, but historical Christianity believes in the Trinity, that there's one God, yet three distinct individual persons within the Godhead. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have God the Holy Spirit, right? And what's fascinating is that theologians believe they refer to this as a big word. It's called a Christophany, where you see Jesus appearing in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't just show up on the scene when he was born in a manger. Jesus has always existed, existed way before, has existed outside of time, right? And so they refer to this idea of Isaiah seeing the Lord. It's Jesus sitting there, Right? Matter of fact, the Apostle John actually confirms this in John chapter 12. It says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. He's talking about Jesus in this statement. He saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So in this moment, Isaiah is not seeing Yahweh, God, who no one has ever seen him. He's seen Jesus in this moment seated on a throne. And this is why in the New Testament, you have the New Testament, refiner, New Testament writers referring to Jesus as Lord. Lord Jesus. Meaning, he is the sovereign master of the universe. He is sovereign over all. And, we, and this is reinforced by his position. He is not just hanging out. He is seated on a throne. He's not sitting on a chair He's not sitting on a stool. He is seated on a throne. Why? Because it indicates his authority, his position, his status, that he is king of kings and lord of lords, reigning over all. And it says the hem of his robe filled the temple. Back in Isaiah's days, whenever kings you know, whenever they were dressed up, they would wear long robes that had to literally be carried by people. You think about like a, uh, you know, a bride on her wedding day, you know, the hem of her dress is long and someone has to carry it, right? And it indicates just his position and status. This is who Isaiah saw. And he sees him as sovereign. And we need to get this. My prayer is that we really let this sink deep into us today that Jesus is sovereign over 
several things, over all things. But let's look at a couple of those things that we see in, in Scripture. And we're not, we don't have time to read verses or anything like that. So I just reference them if you're taking notes. But I want you to see that Jesus, according to Scripture, he is sovereign over all creation. Again, Jesus didn't just show up on the scene when he was born into a major. He has always existed. And, and what we need to understand is that he is literally the center of the universe, not us. He is the center of the universe. Scripture says that all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus, and all things exist through him. He is the one that is literally holding the universe together. Your sovereign Lord is holding the universe together. Scripture says that he is the one who spoke the world into existence by the power of his word. This is our Savior who's sovereign over all creation. We see that he is sovereign over our daily lives and our plans. Do you realize that? Scripture says that he created us in our mother's womb, right? We were formed. All things were created by Jesus, for Jesus, and God through Jesus formed us in our mother's womb. Do you know that according to Psalms, that all of our days were written in our sovereign Lord's book? How crazy is that? Even before we were born, God had already had a, a plan for us. All of our days were written in his book. What's crazy, you know, people get hung up on like, man, do we have free will and God's sovereignty and all this stuff, and it's yes to both. <laughs> Because scripture says it, yes, we make real free will decisions. Yet at the same time, God is sovereign. And we see this over and over. Like, for instance, Proverbs says that, um, that God has a final say even after we've made these real decisions. How does that work? I don't know. It just does. It's mind-blowing. James says, listen to this. James 5.15 says we shouldn't even be arrogant in our thinking that we control our lives, that we control our destinies, that we are the master of our own fate. Instead, he says we should say in regards to what were our plans for tomorrow, he said we should say if the Lord wills, we will live out, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. Why? Because ultimately... He's sovereign over our lives. He is also sovereign over all rulers and authorities. The scripture says that all authorities that exist are appointed by God. Like, think about that. Again, we're getting ready to go into election season, and your candidate may not win. My candidate may not win. Guess what? God is still sovereign over all. And for whatever reason, he's going to allow the person that he wants there for whatever reason. Doesn't mean he approves of everything, but he has a bigger purpose than our own preference. Proverbs 21 says, a king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. So even, you think about the presidents, the prime ministers, the rulers of the nations, the kings. Guess what? Ultimately, God is going to have his way. Scripture says in Job that he raises up nations and he brings destruction to those, to others. God is sovereign over all rulers and authorities and nations. Guess what? He is sovereign over all things, meaning no one nor anything can stop him from fulfilling his purpose. Scripture says in Psalms 115.3 that our God is in the heaven and he does all that he pleases. Ephesians 1 says he works all things out according to the counsel of his will. Job said that no plan of God can be thwarted. No plan of God. Daniel says that no one can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? Friends, he is sovereign over all. And what that means for you and I is that he is also sovereign our own, over our own circumstances. Romans 8 says that he works all things out together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose and that should give us some great comfort knowing that even in the most difficult horrible situations somehow god is working all things out we don't see the full picture but he has a plan 
He is sovereign over all. Abraham Kuyper, the great theologian, says there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out, mine. Isaiah's eyes were open to see Jesus, to see the Lord for who he was, to see him as sovereign. And my question for us is how do you view Jesus? How clearly do you see him? Like some of us, we maybe view Jesus as just our BFF. That's my buddy. That's my homeboy. I know Jesus has always got my back. And we're just kind of flipping about that. Some of us treat Jesus like a genie in the bottle. And we only run to him when we need our prayers answered. And friends, can I tell you, if that's how you view Jesus, your Jesus is too small. You aren't seeing him for who he is. Yes, he is our best friend. Yes, he does answer our prayers. But friends, don't forget, he is sovereign. He's master. He is savior. He's Lord of lords. He's king of kings. He holds all things together. May our eyes be lifted up to see how great and how supreme he truly is. He's sovereign. Isaiah not only sees his sovereignty, but he also sees God's holiness. He gets a picture to see what's taking place in heaven, and he sees these angels flying around. And he says in verse 2, he says, Seraphim were standing above him. And just to pause there, seraphim are these angelic beings. And that word literally means the burning ones. Don't understand it. All I know is that they are blazing with the glory of God on them. They are burning. They are shining brightly. And it says they each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they, they flew around. This is to say we get, a, we get the same picture in Revelation 4, 8 when the apostle John goes to heaven. He sees the same seraphim. And listen to this. And it says, and one called to another, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of armies. And I'm not even giving it justice. Could you imagine what is taking place in heaven? This, this holy reverential moment and these angels, these burning ones, man, they are so blown away by the sovereignty of the Lord that they're screaming to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of armies. And, and Isaiah's eyes are open to see this. He sees this picture of God's holiness. That word holy literally means consecrated, set apart. And it has two different meanings. It can, it can refer to something that God has designated as holy. For instance, if you recall when Moses encountered the burning bush, God told him to take off his sandals because the place he stands is holy ground. So God had set that apart. So think about that. God told Moses, like, hey, this is holy space right here. Your feet are dirty. Your shoes are dirty. Take off your sandals. It's holy. It's set apart. It's pure. But listen to this. So God can set things at, apart as holy, but here they are. They're declaring that God is holy. And listen to what you say. means that he is holy by the essence of his nature. See, you and I, we were born into sin. We were not born holy. <laughs> we were not born set apart. But God, who was and is and is to come, he has always been holy, will always be holy, and will always be holy. That is who he is. He is holy by his very essence. He is divine. His whole nature is saturated with holiness, set Apart, God is not like us whatsoever. He's holy. They cry out three times, and in Hebrew thought, if you repeat something a couple times, it literally is conveying a sense of intensity. 
And that's why I say they're, they're screaming, they're yelling at the top of their lungs as they're worshiping, holy, 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 over and over again, because that's who God is. This is why David said to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness, to be in awe of God being not like us. The third thing that we see that Isaiah sees is that he sees God's glory. Listen to this. It says, His glory fills the whole earth, and the foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices. So they're yelling so loud. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah now sees God's glory. And we talked about living for God's glory. We were created for God's glory, meaning his worth, his praise. There's also another word for glory, and that we see here in this kabod. And it literally means heaviness or weightiness. And typically this word is used to describe God's manifest presence. It says that his glory, they, they were saying his glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices. And what happened? The temple was filled with smoke, meaning God's presence was filling the space. His glory, his kabod, his presence was there. And Isaiah is seeing this. We see God's presence in different parts of Scripture. In Exodus 24, it says the appearance of the glory of the Lord descended and was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain. So much so that the people, the children of Israel, they saw God's glory and they were terrified. They were afraid with holy reverence. His glory. When Solomon built the temple, it says that the glory of the Lord filled the temple and God's glory, his presence was so strong that they fell face down before the Lord. His glory. His kabod. And friends, what I want us to understand is that when we gather together, do you realize that Jesus is in our midst? Through the power of his spirit, the Lord is here. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus said when two or three are gathered in, you know, together, I am there in their midst. And now we had the Holy Spirit inside of us. We are the temple, the carriers of his presence, and we are gathered together. And do you realize, friends, that the glory of the Lord is here? And there are moments where we get glimpses and we feel it and we, we, you know, and other times we don't. But friends, make no mistake about it. Don't belittle these gatherings. Don't just look less on this time. Realize that the glory of the Lord is here. And my prayer is that we would see it that we would taste and see God's glory. And that we would respond with awe and reverence to realize that these gatherings don't just take place by happenstance. That it isn't just something that we do to go through the motions. It's something where we gather together to be in the presence of the Lord with one another. To worship him for who he is. Isaiah sees God's sovereignty. Isaiah sees God's holiness. Isaiah sees God's glory. And here's the last thing that we see that Isaiah sees that I hope that you will see. Isaiah sees God's mercy. In verse 5, Isaiah, and I want you to just imagine this, because Isaiah is seeing this <laughs> Clearly. And he is blown away by what he sees. And in this moment, not only does he see the Lord for who he is, but he also sees himself for who he is as well. And he said, then I said, woe is me. For I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies, woe is me. Isaiah had a moment of realization of how small he was 
and how sinful he was, of how broken he was. Because he saw the Lord, he saw the king in all of his sovereignty and all of his holiness and all of his glory. And he's saying, woe is me. Isaiah had a moment of realization of the weight of his own sin because he had seen the Lord. For those of you who maybe have come to church for years, have you ever had that moment? Have you ever had that moment? Because I fear that there are so many people that come to church in the Bible Belt that play the church game who've never had a moment of their own brokenness of the weight of their own sin. And that's so important, friends, because listen, (laughs) what we see with God's holiness is that sin cannot dwell in his presence. Do you realize that? That's why he told Moses to take off his sandals. Psalms 5, 4 says, evil cannot dwell with you. This is why Adam and Eve were separated from God's presence in the garden because why sin entered into the relationship and it separated them from a holy God. And the weight of that, when you think about Isaiah, I'm sure we would have looked at him like, man, this is a man of God. This is someone that God's going to use. But he had a moment of realization of how broken, of how sinful, how guilty he was. And my friends, like for some of us who've never had that moment, man, my prayer is that you would have a true moment because that matters of acknowledging your own sin against a holy God. And this isn't a popular message for the church in America But friends, we cannot have the good news of the gospel unless we have the bad news first. And Isaiah has this moment saying, woe is me, I'm ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. And by him saying I'm a man of unclean lips, he's acknowledging his sin. And this is a picture of repentance. See, there's a lot of people that wanted to just come to church and they're just like, I just want to get to heaven. But they don't ever want to repent of sin. They don't want to change. They just don't want to go to hell. And the fact is, it's repentance, right? We, scripture talks about this idea of repenting, turning away from our sin, acknowledging our sin, repenting, and then looking to the Lord. And Isaiah has this moment, I'm a man of unclean lips. He feels the weight of his sin, and he repents. Friends, this is so important. For anyone that's not a Christian here today, my prayer is that you would have that moment. And the beautiful thing is that when you have that moment, when you're awakened to the holiness of God, and not only to his holiness, but because he's holy, he's also just, and he will punish those who have never turned to him. So scripture says, it's not my words, because he's holy and just. He loves them. He wants them to repent. He's not willing that anyone should perish, but those who willingly reject him, they will face judgment one day before the holiness of God. And so this matters of having that moment. And the beautiful thing, though, is that God welcomes all people who humble themselves who acknowledge their sin, who realize that they have fallen short of God's glory and repent and believe in Jesus. And what happens is that he offers mercy because the Lord is slow to anger and rich in love. He's gracious and compassionate, forgiving our iniquity, not counting our sin against us. And what we see here is that Isaiah, he encounters the weight of his sin, right? And I'll never forget, man, that, that, that's my story. Like, I grew up in church, but it wasn't until years later where I felt the weight of my own sin. And it was like, man, my eyes were open to see the beauty of the gospel of why I needed a Savior. And there was something in that moment where I was fl- just over whelmed by the grace and the mercy of our holy God. And there's nothing like that. 
And Isaiah has this moment of awakening, and, and it says that one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. And so what, what essentially, there's, there's some symbolism going on here. We know that altar is, altars in the Old Testament refer to sacrifices. That's where sacrifices were made in order for sins to be forgiven. See, sin is so serious before a holy God that he required an animal sacrifice to take the punishment for our sins so that we would not die for our sins. And so we see this idea of an altar being here, which is a picture of sacrifice, and it says they took a coal, right? And it, a glowing coal. And the idea here is like, and this harkens back to Leviticus 16 when the, when the, the high priest in order to, for their sins to be forgiven, they would take a coals off of a sacrifice. So it was part of their, their, their ritual in order to make atonement for their sins. And so it says, he touched my mouth with that coal and said, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity, your sins are removed and your sin is atoned for. Man, in that moment, Isaiah feels the weight of his own sin. He has a moment of realization, but then he experienced something that superseded the weight of his sin, and that was God's mercy. <laughs> See, God loves to forgive those who come to him humbly. It's what he does. God loves to give us grace and to offer us mercy, not because we do anything to earn it, but because it's who he is. God is merciful. <laughs> he is merciful. He is full of holiness, but he is full of mercy as well, which is so amazing. He is so loving that he extends mercy to us. And it says that they atoned that his sin was atoned for. That word atoned literally means to be taken away. His sin defiled him. It, makes, it made him unclean. It separated him from a holy God. But his sin was taken away. It was paid for by a greater sacrifice. And friends, listen. Christians, listen. For those of us who've had that moment, I'm not saying we're perfect or anything, but we, we, we could think back on that moment, right? <laughs> May we never lose the awe of that moment of having our sins forgiven, of being declared righteous and holy and forgiven. Like that in and of itself should stir our hearts to want to live for the glory of God, to want to live to enjoy him, to want to lift our hands in worship, to want to bow before the Lord, to want to sing, to want to clap. Why? Because we have not only seen the king, but we see ourselves for who we are. We see our brokenness, and we are nothing without the Lord. May we respond with awe and reverence to his amazing mercy in our lives. Because, friends, this is our story. We know 1 John 2, 2, he says this, he himself, talking about Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for yours, but also for the whole world. Christ paid the ultimate price he lived the perfect life that you and I can never live. He died in our place. He took the punishment for our sins and then was raised back to life. And everyone who believes on Jesus will be saved. And friends, that should be enough for us to want now, in view of God's mercy, to offer up our lives, our bodies, as what? Living sacrifices to the Lord. And out of all this, after experiencing the Lord's sovereignty and holiness and glory and his mercy, God says, who will go for me? And what does he do? Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. I mean, my life no longer belongs to me. My life is for your name and for your glory. And friends, that should be our response. See, all these pictures should cause us to want to respond now to what? Live for God's glory and to enjoy him. 
It should cause us to want to sing for God's glory and to enjoy him. Are you guys seeing this? Because the quality of our worship is dictated by how clear we see the Lord for who he is. Let's pray. As we're getting ready to close today, we're just going to have a moment of response and a worship team is joining me on stage right now. Prayer team's coming forward. So every head bowed and eye closed and no one looking around. Have you seen the Lord? Like, do you see the Lord for who he is? Has your view of the Lord been too small? Has it been jaded? Friends, my prayer is that in this moment you see him for who he is. And not only see him for who he is, but also see yourself for who you are. And for what he's done for you. If you're not a Christian here today, have you had that moment? My prayer is that right now, you would have that moment. In just a moment, our, our worship team's gonna sing a song. And if you wanna accept the Lord, Jesus, not only as your savior, but as your sovereign Lord, you wanna give him control of your life, I wanna invite you to come forward and not even hesitate. Don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. I wanna invite you to come forward. I'm going to be standing down front. Our prayer team will be standing down front. If anyone wants to receive Jesus today, we'll be down here. For the rest of us who are Christians, man, I pray that as we respond in worship, that we respond according to God's word for who he is. If you're a Christian, man, celebrate the gospel, that your sins have been atoned for, that you have mercy today, and you could do that through communion. God, we love you. Sovereign Lord, we love you. We worship you. It's not about us. We exist for you, by you. You sustain us. And I pray, Father God, that we would see Jesus for who he is, that your spirit would help us to respond with worship in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand up right now? I want to invite you to come forward. Like I said, I'll be down front if you'd like to receive the Lord today.